It's too funny. Oh, it's too funny. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, my oh, God. Oh, my God. Oh, my well, we know this is going to be a lively conversation because they already started it. So now we've got to get, we've got to get caught up with them before they get too far down the road. Uh, just as a, a quick audience survey, we'll do a couple of these at the start of the sessions. How many of you came today because someone else in your book club told you about this event? Look at that. And that too speaks to the power of community of readers. That's wonderful. Welcome to our keynote conversation today. This particular session is sponsored in part by the, the Popewood Queens, a large book club in the United States, and we'll be hearing a little bit more about that club in particular later this afternoon, but I do want to quick recognition to them for sponsoring not only this event, but our entire year's worth of visiting writers programs, of which today is the culminating event, and we picked a fantastic pair to end this first visiting writers series with. It is possible, and I don't want to admit this into a microphone while we're recording, but I will say it's possible that I may have created the entire Low Country Book Club convention just to have an excuse to invite Will Schwabley <laughs> to Beaver, South Carolina. I am, I'm a fan, let's put it that way. Author and awesome human being, Will Schwalbe, is a former senior vice president and editor-in-chief of Hyperion Books and the founder and CEO of Cookster.com. A as a journalist, he has written for publications as near and as far away as the New York Times and the South China Morning Post. Will is the co-author with David Shipley of the book, Send, Why People Email So Badly and How to Do Better. His second book, which I suspect many of you are familiar with, was the End of Your Life Book Club, a memoir of books he read with his dying mother. That book was selected as a number one indie next pick, a book page book of the year, an entertainment weekly best book of the year, and as a Books for Better Life award winner. His most recent book is Books for Living, an exploration of the roles books can play in our lives. The New York Times praised that book as inspiring and charming, and the Christian Science Monitor deemed it an utterly restorative series of vignettes about how books can not only deepen a life, but save it. And representing Team Conroy is the Queen Mother of the Pat Conroy Literary Center. Cassandra King Conroy is the award-winning <laughs> author of five novels, most recently the Southern Gothic Tour de Force, Moonrise, as well as the nonfiction work, The Same Sweet God, same, same, excuse me, The Same Sweet Girls Guide to Life, Advice from a Failed Southern Belle. Cassandra is the honorary chair of our Pat Conroy Literary Center and a newly named Alabama Humanities Foundation Fellow. Please welcome Cassandra. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Does um, can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Okay, uh, this is um, a very special, special event. It sort of evolved, as I understand it. Uh, Jonathan, I, um, I I knew we were that Will we were very fortunate to have uh, Will come his first trip to Beaufort, so we have to really make him feel welcome and, and let him know what uh, Southern hospitality is all about. And um, uh, that Jonathan had asked if if um, I would uh, uh, be willing to to interview. Well, on stage, and so sort of ironically, we go back a little bit in that he was at uh, Hyperion, my publisher in New York, when uh, when I first came on board, and uh, so I had I had met Will there, but then sort of disassociated, and I'll tell you what I mean by that in, in, in a minute. Well, that might have a double meaning. We won't go, in, we won't go into that. But, uh, <clears throat> so of course, I was I was uh, thrilled to, to be able to do this and that we had such a distinguished writer coming to uh, Buford as, as well to, for, uh, to do an event for the Literary Center. Um, but um, in 19, oh, not 19, what happened? 2013, I was just born in 1913. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I, I lost my youngest sister to, to cancer.
cancer and she had one one son she had been a single mother for a few years so she and her son were very very close and I read about this book the end of life book club and I knew that that my nephew also named Will was of course having great difficulty my sister was in her early 50s and Will was in college and he was having you know great difficulty of course you know naturally dealing with his mother's illness and terminal illness and so when I read about this book I know my sister worried that sometimes he would he would come when he would visit her he would be fidgety and you know he would not know what to say to her in their sort of this new situation and as soon as I did without even reading the book without making the connection that it was the wills war you know that had been at Hyperion I immediately got a book for myself and I sent my nephew one and I said this is something you need to do with your mother she she's an avid reader and he wasn't much of a reader you know like a lot of guys he's one of these he's been more into he's a physical therapist now in bodybuilding and this sort of stuff but it just it was such an important book in in our lives at that very crucial time and I can imagine this book being being so for for the people so I did want to to start out before we get to your to the book that we're mainly going to be focusing on today books for living tell us about your experience with with your mother's illness in this book as as a way of the book eventually came out of the experience of course of talking with your mother during her illness oh well thank you and thank you for sharing that story with me one of the great privileges I think of this life that we have and I'm such an admirer of Cassandra's writing and one of the great privileges is that people share their stories with you and I think that's one of the greatest gifts we can ever give each other is to share our stories it's very fitting obviously to the end of your life book club and it's just wonderful to be at this this first book club event because book club was the one of the best things in my mother in my life in her last two years as she was dying of pancreatic cancer and I'll never forget that day I was sitting with her in the chemo suite and there she was and we're gonna be there for three to seven hours depending and we started talking about crossing to safety by Wallace Stegner yes who here has read crossing to safety so half of you are unbelievably blessed and the other half are even more so because you will get you will get to read this magnificent book and so I had this thing as I seen there with my mother I said you know mom if we keep meeting like this and keep talking about books it's kind of like a book club and her reaction was instantaneous she said don't be silly sweetie it can't possibly be a book club and I said really why not and she said because there's no food and actually it's always very amused to see that the topic of the the next stuff because there certainly was no wine in the chemo suite that we were in but we decided that yes indeed it was a book club and would be so right up until the days before she died and why it was such a powerful and important thing is multifold and one of the reasons is when we were reading together we weren't a sick person and a well person we were just a mother and a son talking about books on allowed us to go on these amazing journeys even though she was confined we could travel the world we could be in the Paris of the elegance of the hedgehog we could be in in PG Woodhouse's London we could be in Donna Leone's Venice all right there and it also gave us a way of talking about the things that were most important to talk about but also most difficult 
Uh, so for example, and don't worry, I'm not spoiling any plot. Um, in Crossing to Safety, there's a woman named Charity, and she's dying of cancer. And we were able to talk about whether Charity's husband, Larry, would be okay after Charity died. And we agreed that Larry would be very sad, but he'd be okay. And of course, we weren't talking about Charity and Larry. We were talking about my mother and my father. But that was too direct and too painful a topic for us ever to address head on. So Crossing to Safety and our book club gave us the gift of a kind of conversation that I don't think we ever otherwise would have had. Oh, that, absolutely, that's a wonderful example that I think of discussing books, but especially at certain, certain points in, in our lives and being able, I think like uh, with, with your kids, you know, to, to uh, recommend a book and you say, would you read it? Uh, well, what did you think about you know, the situation or so, so forth, but what about uh, maybe with the grandkids? Or what about, how do you think this, this person felt being bullied or whatever, you know? So it's, it, it is, it's a wonderful um, a way of opening up a, a discussion that might not otherwise uh, occur. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I, w I wanted to make sure that, that we um, talked about that before we got to uh, Books for Living, which is your most recent book. Is that just yours? It's yourself? been out uh, exactly one year. Okay. And uh, there are 26 books that um, that Will writes about in uh, Books for Living. But what I wanted to uh, point, point out that he makes very clear uh, in discussing this book is that these books are not necessarily the best books he's ever read, or even his most favorite books. That what book, so, so it gave it a little bit different uh, twist. I think Pat wrote uh, My Reading Life, and uh, he wrote mostly about books that were, <laughs> yeah, uh, that were more like his favorite books and books that had influenced him as, as, as a writer. And so, Will, I think you take um, uh, a different approach. I, I didn't, I can't right offhand think of a book that you talked about in here that influenced you as a writer in, in sort of uh, uh, admiring a style of a writer or something like that. Uh, more, yours were more, uh, what, what, I, what I got out of it, more what these books have to teach us not just what they have to teach us about life, but this this was particularly um, um, said a lot to me this time, you know, not what do they have to teach us about modern life, you know, and and what what we deal with um, that these books had had spoken to to you at a, a certain uh, time in your life, and I have a. Um, uh, a couple of things about this that I wanted to point out. You you talk about uh, every book that that we read in some way changes our life, even if it's not a book that makes a particularly good Im impression on me. And it, you know, I I thought about it, it's almost like you know when we eat the, the food that we eat, we eat a lot of junk food, then we're not going to be very healthy. But you know we eat that. So it becomes the cells of our body. So what we take into our, our brain, you know, the brain food has, has uh, influence. And so that's, that's how I, I sort of read that. Every book we take into to our, uh, our lives. Um, okay, now I wanted, I wanted to, I thought this, I wanted to read this. Actually, I should ask Will to read it, but I'm going to read it. <laughs> uh, to me, this was the best description of modern life that, that I've ever read. We're, uh, we're, Will's kind of examining here, and I believe, yeah, this is still in the introduction of the book, of, of why we still need to read, why, why we read, and what we get out of reading, and so forth. And um, 
so he says we over schedule our days and complain constantly about being too busy how does that sound familiar to anyone <laughs> we shop endlessly for stuff we don't need and then feel oppressed by the clutter that surrounds us we rarely sleep well or enough we compare our bodies to the artificial ones we see in magazines and our lives to the exaggerated ones we see on television. We watch cooking shows and then eat fast food. We worry ourselves sick and join gyms we don't visit. We keep up with, a hunt with hundreds of acquaintances but rarely see our best friends. That hit home with me. <clears throat> We bombard ourselves with video clips and emails and instant messages. We even interrupt our interruptions. When it comes time for us to decide what we should buy and how we should spend our free time, we expect ever more choice. And in order to try to make our way through all the options we've created ourselves for ourselves, we've turned the whole world into an endless catalog of catalog of picks and pans in which anything that isn't deemed to be mind-blowing is regarded as useless. We no longer damn things with faint praise. We damn them with any praise that is less than ecstatic. And loving or loathing, five stars and none. But you go on to say, if you could, I'm not, I won't read this part, I'll, I'll hear it from, from you, is the heart of all this is fear. So, fear, yes. And thank you so much for, for reading that, that uh, passage. Um, it's funny, there's... Uh, Fantastic. I have to say, as a, as a side note, um, there's a wonderful actor who does my audiobooks, um, and I don't, I don't read them myself, and uh, someone said, do you mind someone reading your audiobook instead of you? And I said, no, no. Um, when I hear him do it, I think, oh, that's what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Uh, this fear of missing out, uh, I think, is one of the most pernicious things we all deal with. Um, and, and I think of it, uh, you know, like last night, for example, a um, wonderful guy from uh, Point Car Service named Wilson drove me to town. And uh, he was very proudly telling me about Buford, and I, I was really excited in hearing everything. And, and I said to him, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little hungry, where should I go for dinner? And he said, oh, go to Plum's and get the Frogmore traditional boil. I'm like, okay. So I went to Plum's, I had it, I thought it was so tasty. I just, I thought it was delicious. I loved the sausage, I loved, I loved everything about it. Now, in our modern world, that's not normal. What's normal is to get there and instantly get on your little phone and say, what's the best Frogmore boil in Buford? And then to discover that while well, you might think the Plum's Frogmore Boil is good, someone else thinks that the really great Frogmore Boil is to be had at another place halfway across town, and maybe it's open and maybe it's closed. And we do this all the time to ourselves. We're never satisfied. We're always in search of the better thing. And so we, we come across this world, and it's something I write about a lot in Books for Living, about where we denigrate mediocrity as though mediocrity were a bad thing. <laughs> and I'm on a crusade to revive and celebrate mediocrity. <laughs> uh, ben Franklin actually called our country a happy mediocrity. And he meant that as the highest words of praise. And the idea was a society where everybody was kind of well off and kind of liked things. Um, and it's such a wonderful way of living. Uh, one of the books I write about early in Books for Living uh, is uh, The Odyssey. And I hold it up as the ultimate celebration of mediocrity. <laughs> because when you think about it, Odysseus was really great at a lot of things. The man was great at war, great at Trojan horses, but he was thoroughly mediocre at getting home. <laughs> Everyone else did it in a couple months. It took him 10 years. But, but that was OK. He eventually he made it there. Um, and it says, as long as you eventually get home and straighten things out, you're good. And, and back to what Cassandra pointed out, I wanted to write about 26 books that had touched me, 
not the twenty six greatest books ever written, because i think any book is a wonderful book if it finds you when you need it most and i and i think when we approach books and friends and life and frogmore boils with the spirit of just enjoying them just just partaking in whatever it is they have to offer that is actually the recipe for getting more meaning and fulfillment and happiness out of life it's not about peak experience it's about enjoying the experiences that life offers absolutely well said thank you um what uh, I, I love this because this has happened to me so many times that that you uh, that you talk about uh, several times in the book that so many times the universe gives us the book we need to read at the time and I, I believe so many experiences occur to us and we do uh, ignore those at our own peril as as you you bring out and, and uh, maybe this would be something to for a very good discussion uh, when we have our discussion time in a few minutes to think about what books have been handed to you by the universe uh, at a time when you when you needed uh, these these books and um, you have a writer who I had I was not familiar with at all but of course it was from the 30s when I was just a very young child <laughs> uh, <laughs> and and he you have your chapter begins with Lin Young Tang anyone familiar with the Chinese writer Lin Young Tang um, I, I was not either, but then you refer to several times. He, he comes up again when you're discussing other books besides his book, which it has a wonderful title now. Let's see if I wrote that down. The Importance of Living. And that's such an understated title when you think about it. I mean, I just kind of read right over it and didn't think about it. Um, but, but then I thought, wait a minute, The Importance of, of Living as opposed to what, guys? You know, oh, okay. So even the title, you know, is a bit of zen there. But so, yeah. so tell us oh, about so happy to run up. Okay, so first of all, um, if I talk about Lily Tang too much, someone just has to get up and wave a white flag and say, I surrender. Because um, a lot of this book, it's a theme that runs all through it. And in many ways, Books for Living is a book that was inspired by The Importance of Living by Lin Yu Tang. And it's a book that came to me in those kind of weird ways that, that I think the books of our lives come to us. Um, and in this case, um, as a kid, I was kind of obsessed with the movie Cabaret. Cabaret led me to the writings of Christopher Isherwood, on which they were based. Isherwood led me to the other writers of the 1930s, like Louis McNeese and W.H. Auden. Those led me to read everything I could about the 1930s. And I kept seeing this book mentioned called The Importance of Living by Lin Yu Tang. Now, um, I had never heard of it. None of you, by, by raise of hands, had ever heard of it. But this book was the monster bestseller of 1937 and 1938. Everyone in the entire world was reading The Importance of Living. It was like Tuesdays with Maury on steroids <laughs> in the late 30s. And it's a book about the Chinese way of life explained to the rest of the world. And it's a book about what Lynn calls the noble art of leaving things undone. And he says, if you have spent an absolutely useless afternoon doing absolutely nothing, then you have mastered the art of living. Um, and he writes about seeing your friends and reading poetry. He makes a big plea that everyone should lie in bed for at least two hours every morning after they wake up, just read, chill. No matter what, who you are, what you do, he thinks this is essential. Uh, and he's a great humanist, and reading looms so large. And, and as I was reading this book, The Importance of Living, uh, it's a book that sneaks up on you. Because at first you think, oh, this is silly and fun and a little twee and, and adorable and fine or whatever. And then you start to notice certain themes. So remember what year I told you it was a big bestseller, 37, 38. And Lin Yutang starts to mention Stalin and Hitler in the course of this book. And he starts to warn about the greed and the, the lust for power he sees, and about the twin dangers of communism and fascism. And in The Importance of Living, what he's really doing is saying 
that the business of being a human the business of enjoying food seeing one another not being greedy reading conversing getting together at occasions like this this isn't something trivial this is what being human is all about and this is the most powerful antidote we have against fascism and mind control so the importance of living is not just to enjoy life it's to resist all of the worst temptations of human nature uh, and so i just rereading this book in our, our current environment um, and it's 600 of mildly crazy pages too. So you know, I tried to pick out all the best books and put them in um, books for a living. And, and I've been in touch with Lynn's daughter, um, who's fabulous and she, she was fully on board for my doing that. But it's just, it comes up in so many ways. And one of the things that was cracking me up about when I was writing the book and reading it is Lin Yu Tang, for example, tells a story about the most famous tea house in China. And he said, people travel from all over the world to drink tea at the most famous tea house in China. But he said when they get there, they all do the same thing. They're served their tea, 1937, and they let it get cold while they take pictures of themselves drinking the tea <laughs> and take pictures of each other drinking the tea. And I thought, <laughs> Does that sound like uh, 1937 or? Uh, uh, modern days. Um, well, I, I thought of the 26 books that you have, each each of these, um, well, I think speaks to some of the specific challenges of, of living um, in our modern world. And, and I, so I started listing some of these and thought then for our discussion that we would, I would look at um, uh, uh, half a dozen or so of, of these books that sort of illustrate the, some of the challenges is the need to recharge. And I think we, you know, uh, Lynn uh, Yutang's book, certainly. Uh, the need to be nourished. Isn't that a great reason to, to read? To nap. And I loved, and now he would, was he talking about Confucius when he told you not just that you needed to nap to a, well, no, he, I'm, I'm, I'm getting mixed up. With no, another, no, 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 that's writer. right. It was, he did talk about Confucius, and he talked about... A way that you're supposed to, the position you're supposed oh, to... Oh, absolutely. He's very bossy when you tank. You put your arm here, your leg there, you do this, you do that. Yeah, but very... I'm napping the right way, obviously. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, to, co to, to connect to each other in many ways, uh, to understand more about sensitivity, to know when to quit, to accept loss and to choose a path for our lives that, um, that I would. So, just for fun, um, I can't remember if this is the one, the second one maybe after, or maybe you start out with this one. But I was, okay, so, so Wills is intellectually, you know, intellectual, classically trained guy and so forth. And I was very surprised when I saw that he had a discussion here at the girl on the train. Does everybody know that? <laughs> a thriller. That was great, great fun uh, to read. So I'm thinking, what on earth do we, uh, what, are you, what are you saying here about um, what we get out of, why would we read thrillers, you know, to, to sort of step back to the mo modern world and so forth. And I, and I really loved what... Uh, so, you tell, so you tell yeah, oh, I love, and that's one of the uh, one of the things that makes me really saddest when I travel around the country. And by the way, I should say I've been on a more than seventy city book tour, and this is the last stop. This is the uh, <laughs> I save the best for last. Um, but when I when I travel around, very often people say the same thing to me because I ask everybody, "What are you reading?" It's the best question in the book. What are you reading? And sometimes people say, "Oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading." And they name a, a, a thriller or a mystery or some other kind of book. And I'm like, don't ever apologize for what you're reading. I love mysteries and thrillers. I think that's fantastic. And, and what about it? And how'd you hear about it? And, and we have the best conversations. And one of the reasons I love mysteries and thrillers is as follows. My day job is in an office. And it's quite a typical office. And uh, most people there have my back but a couple of people are trying to put a knife in it. <laughs> the essential skill is, who is who? 
when you read thrillers and mystery novels, you exercise your ability to tell the bad people from the good people. But reading The Girl on the Train, um, what's fascinating is in a world where you don't know who you can trust, we have one of three narrators who isn't even sure she can trust herself. And that, I think, is a marvelous lesson for life, is sometimes when we're running around being suspicious of other people, the person whose motives we should be examining, the person whose memory we should be questioning, is our own. And there's one universal lesson I've learned from reading thrillers uh, and mysteries, and I will share it with you, it is the one person you must never trust is the person who says, trust me. <laughs> I thought uh, a book that, that uh, does that so well to me, uh, of course I'm, I'm a little bit prejudiced, but uh, Lords of Discipline, you know how they had the secret uh, uh, organization of the 10, and Pat has you guessing who's in your, and, and then it ended up with me, it was the last person I suspected. But the people that, you know, that, that are least trustworthy uh, weren't necessarily uh, the 10. So I, I, I love that, and uh, I like to write uh, my, my books with multiple uh, narrators. It's actually my favorite way to, to write. I haven't written all my books that way, but if, I, I, if it worked, I would. Because I, that that's that's what you get. You you're going to see something from one point of view, and then and this is life. I mean, this happens. Then you hear someone else's point of view, and it's not the same. So what what do you trust? But I had not thought of, of reading uh, thrillers uh, as as being a way to sort of hone those uh, those skills. I love I love that. Um, I, uh, let's see, I, I was looking at, um, oh, I just talk, oh, talked about the skill. You have Zen and the Art of Archery um, that um, reading is often taught as a skill. Uh, but is that, is that the way, is that the, the way do we get the most out of reading? Well, I'm so glad you brought this up. This is, um, my, my editor, this was his favorite chapter, the chapter on Zen and the Art of Archery, but, but you're the first person actually who in any form like this who's asked me um, a question about it, and I think it's maybe because you're a writer. And this is the, the chapter about um, really the art of reading. Um, and has anyone heard of the book Zen and the Art of Archery? A couple people. Um, this was a book from the 1940s by a German professor who went to uh, Japan to teach and wound up wanting to learn archery. And it's the inspiration for the title of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, although the two books have precious little to do with one another. Um, and he learns, it, it's one of these books, which is a tiny little book with such powerful life wisdom. And again, on this theme of 26 books that they're all different kinds of books and not the books you'd expect. I wanted a book like this. I also have a chapter about cookbooks and the wisdom you get from cookbooks. I have Stuart Little is a book I discuss. Um, and this is a book, Zen and the Art of Archery, that's just the kind of book you, you stumble across somewhere. I, I can't remember how um, I stumbled across it. But I realized that Zen and the Art of Archery was for me the perfect metaphor for reading and why I love reading so much. And, and at the heart of it, I found this incredible contradiction because my very best reading experiences are when I get so wrapped up in a book that I no longer know I'm reading. So the art of reading is to forget that you're reading. Uh, and the art of archery is to have it so ingrained and so effortless that you don't release the arrow the arrow releases itself. And the Zen master uses beautiful images to describe this. Um, he talks about when a leaf is covered with snow, and at some point, the snow falls off the leaf, and the leaf springs back. The snow doesn't decide to fall. 
and the leaf doesn't decide to spring back. It just happens. And that which is art is that which is effortless. And so he talks about how to paint a tree. And it's to look at trees for a decade, and then you paint. And so this reading, this idea of reading is the art that ultimately becomes most effortless. But it's the art you practice by reading. And that every time you read, you become a better reader. And I must say, I had that experience this very morning. And Nancy, who's been looking after me, took me to Blackstone's for breakfast. As you can see, my life revolves around food and meals. But I was late because I was rereading The Sunday Wife, which I had read when it came out. And I know what was going to happen. But I got so wrapped up in the characters and their lives that time disappeared. Where I was disappeared. Everything disappeared but me and those extraordinary characters. And I do want to say just another word about that book because it's very fresh in my mind. But it's a great example, too, about how great books reveal themselves to you over time and how they touch on so much. I mean, that you wrote that book then, and there are the themes of gay marriage. And there's themes that have so much to do with the Me Too movement and the idea of women talking about control over their bodies and what's appropriate and what isn't and boundaries. There's Celeste, the wonderful psychic. I mean, there's so much there. And it's a book that – it's a different book every time you read it. And to me, that's very much Zen and the Art of Archery. Well, thank you. You didn't pay me too much. I think I loved it. The title caught my eye, of course, Zen and the Art of Archery because it's just a great title. But I took archery in college and just loved it. How many of you archers? I know a lot of you. Isn't it wonderful? Yeah, it is so wonderful. I do have to fess up, and I admit this in the book, that I was such a bad archer that the only time I actually scored a bullseye was on the target of the person next to me. That's how far I missed my target. And I was at a summer camp, and you got a badge. And the instructor said, we will give you your badge if you promise never to shoot a bow and arrow again, ever. So I never have. I'm glad you told it because I thought that was, that was such a great story. And I see that uh, our time is not cooperating very well with us. Well, I'm glad you already mentioned um, the Odyssey because I, I, uh, who would ever think that the takeaway from the Odyssey is mediocrity? You know, I love that. So, so we won't. Uh, uh, this wonderful uh, book, uh, Palacio, Wonder? Oh, Wonder by R.J. Palacio. I have a Palacio. chapter about that. Okay. Yeah. Made into a movie now with uh, Julia Roberts. I wondered if that was a movie because I'd heard of, of – uh, would you tell us about what you take away from this is, is uh, empathy and choosing kindness and always choosing to be kinder than is necessary. Yes, oh, that's exactly the phrase. That's, that's what spoke to me. So I, I write in this chapter, and I, I love this book, Wonder, by R.J. Palacio. It's, it's a middle grade reader, so it was originally written for fifth graders about a boy um, with a facial deformity who is going to school for the first time. Um, and uh, it's, it's a book where we, the reader, get to exercise our empathy muscles and where we get to see in action the importance of choosing not just to be kind, but to be kinder <laughs> than is necessary. Um, and it's, it's just such a beautiful book. And I write about it in terms of actually diet books. I start the chapter by saying every January I go into the bookstore and I buy a whole slew of diet books. And this is the year I'm going to drop those 10 pounds that I've always intended to drop. Um, and, I, and it's very hopeful. Um, and I, and I embark on it with this great spirit. Um, and there's something wonderful just about buying the books. <laughs> it just means I recognize that there's a goal to work towards. Um, and that's a good thing. And, it, and just buying the books makes me a little more mindful about the choices I make. And whether I follow those consistently or not, I'm glad that I still have that impulse within me. Um, and I think Wonder is a book that we too can sort of 
think daily about how to exercise our capacity for kindness. But to start every day not just thinking, am I going to be a little more thoughtful about what I eat? But am I going to be a little more thoughtful about how I treat people? And is today going to give me opportunities to be kinder than is necessary? And today is today going to be the day when I, when I, I take up the world on that challenge? Um, and, and this is a theme that I wrote about also in the End of Your Life book club. Because my mother was a very devout Christian, and her faith uh, gave her enormous solace and joy. Um, and she saw it every day as, as an opportunity, as a Christian, to be a little kinder than is necessary, to try to do that kind of work out in the world. Um, and that gave her such joy. And I think, really, in some ways, wonder is about the very same thing. And these opportunities abound. So standing in line at the deli in New York, and the person in front of me doesn't speak English well and doesn't really know how to order, I can stamp my feet in frustration and huff and puff, or I can offer to help. And every day gives you these opportunities. And, and that's why I think wonder. If people sometimes ask me, um, is there one book that you would have everyone read? And I say, yup, that book is wonder. Okay. I brought that up then, because uh, I have several more that I'm not going to have time to. But as, as far as I remember, you had like three what we think of as children's books. This would be what we'd call a middle middle grade uh, book. And you had Stuart Little, as, as you mentioned. And um, what about more and more? More and more and more, more, said the baby. Yeah, more and more, more. <laughs> You'll have to read the book to see what I see. That's where I get political. <laughs> yeah, I think that's but, uh, we have. We have uh, just but a few I, minutes left. So I did want to say one thing, because um, it was such a wonderful theme in my reading life, and I, it's something I wanted to talk about because it's one of the most important themes to me. Um, reading Pat Conroy, and I'm so bad at names, talking about his beloved teacher. Oh, yes. Um, what his teacher's name was? Gene Norris. Gene Norris. Yes. And, and reading in this beautiful Norris. book he wrote about um, being there with Gene and about the trips and the experiences and the books that Gene put in his way. Um, books for Living is in some ways my love letter to a couple people who put books in my way. Yes. And one of the most important chapters to me is a chapter about my school librarian, Miss Locke, and how she left on a cart for me Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin, yes. which was the book I really needed to read when I really needed to read it. Um, and, and I like Pat, who says he doesn't know if he ever thanked Gene enough, although it sure looks like he did. <laughs> I tried to thank Miss Locke enough for all she did for me and a generation of students, but I, I never know if I, I really thanked her enough. So in some ways, it's a love letter to librarians. It's a love letter to teachers of all different kinds. The Odyssey chapter is about my brilliant high school Latin teacher, Mr. Tracy. Um, but it's also a, um, a love letter to um, booksellers um, and just book enthusiasts um, and the role that we all play in, in each other's lives by just making sure to put into each other's hands the books we need when we when we need them. And, and I'm so glad we sort of come have come full circle because talking about the universe providing a book when we need it and your librarian just happened to leave a book when she knew you were going to be there, leave a book uh, lying around that she thought you needed uh, or that you would get something out of. But we do need to, to find out what you folks want to ask Will when you have a chance to, uh, to do so. So, questions? question is, how much do I rely on book reviews? Um, I actually, my, here's the three main ways that I find out what to read. And, and to some degree, the first two are influenced by book reviews, but indirectly. Um, the first is 
ask a librarian. I walk into my local library, there's amazing people there, and I say, what to read? What should I read? Tell me. And um, they're very influenced by book reviews and their choice, so that's sort of secondary. Second thing is I ask a bookseller. I have a fantastic indie bookstore near me, um, and I'd love to go in there, and, and I say the same thing. Um, I, I'm less interested by, I'm sorry, less influenced by book reviews than I am by the secondary conversation around them. Um, but my third method, and I really urge it on everyone, and, and this comes right back to Cassandra's first question, which is I let the universe tell me. And I do that in two ways. If I hear about a book three times in a week, I have to buy it. <laughs> and I am an incredibly clumsy person. And if I knock over a book in a bookstore, <laughs> I have to buy it. And I just have to tell you quickly a story from this tour. I told that story in the Wellesley Bookstore in Wellesley, Mass. I got up, I knocked over a book, I looked at it, it was called Warrior Cats. <laughs> and the bookseller said, well, you, you don't have to buy Warrior Cats. And I was like, yeah, I just told a whole bunch of people that I had to have it. So I bought Warrior Cats, I threw it in my backpack, Friends took me to dinner, they brought friends to theirs, their friends brought their 18-year-old daughter. I said, what are you reading? She named a book. I said, what do you think? She said, it's kind of boring. And I said, oh, I agree, I think that's a boring book too. And then I said, well, just tell me, what's the book that rocked your world, your favorite book you ever read? And she said, you're gonna think it's nuts, but it's a book called Warrior Cats. <laughs> and I pulled it out of my backpack. And I swear, she screamed. <laughs> so the universe usually knows what you need to read. That's, that's a great story that you, you shared there. Um, are there other specific books, like Margaret? I think you should do your own audio books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, listen to Jeff first, and then tell me he's really good, but thank you. Um, actually, I am starting a podcast in a couple weeks, um, which is going to be um, me talking to authors about the books that changed their life. And I'm gonna put um, one author on the spot. Cassandra, will you be a guest on my <laughs> podcast? I would be honored to. Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, I haven't come up with a name. So if you, um, I'm will.schwalbe at gmail.com, and if you have a good name for my podcast, send it to me, please. I'll think of some suitable reward. Or your cats. <laughs> Warrior cats, fantastic. Oh, well, you know, talking about books, you did, you did have something in here about has a book saved your life? So that might be a good way to end, too, because uh, uh, Will gave a couple of specific examples of people being shot, and they were carrying a book that literally saved their lives. Yes. So that's sort of a metaphor, too, for, but... Uh, but I loved, and I had that down, I've forgotten which one of the uh, books I had that written for a discussion, you know, if we had uh, had time. So, well, let's talk just a minute then about the books. Uh, you, you said, I don't know so much if a book has saved my life so much as helped me choose my life. And I, I loved that. I thought that was a great way to look at that. Thank you. I mean, I, I think, it's, it's a theme that goes through the book a lot. Yes. And, and it's a... Um, so, as you'll see if you buy and read books for a living, um, the Giovanni's Room helped me see the life that was ahead of me in a way that I could look at it without dread. And so I, I, I say it's a book that saved the life that I have. Uh, another book um, that I write about, um, and this was the hardest chapter to write, um, but the chapter that was most meaningful to me is the chapter about David Copperfield. Uh, and I write, I mean, it's very much of a theme with the End of Your Life Book Club. I write about the experience I had reading David Copperfield as a kid. And I loved Beyond Love, this book. Um, and for a lonely summer with my crazy grandmother in Westport, Connecticut, my only friends were David <laughs> and little Emily and a steer court. Um, and when I finished that book and turned the last page, I burst into tears because I thought these people are gone from my life forever. That that's the last I'll ever see of, of Dora and David and little Emily and Steerforth. 
But of course, I was totally wrong. That these are still my friends, and they live with me, and I talk to them all the time. Just as I still talk to my mother, and just as going around talking about that book is joyous. And, and I read about when I was just out of college, my best friend, whose name was also David, was killed in a terrible accident. And I was so miserable, I didn't think I could ever be happy again. I really did think my life was over in some very significant way. And then I started to think about David Copperfield and the fact that I get to choose whether I remember the joy I had reading David Copperfield or the grief I had when I finished reading it. And when I think of my friend David Bear who was killed, I too get to choose whether I remember the joy that we had in all our adventures together or the grief I felt when I learned that he'd been killed. And, and that's really a theme that runs all through books for living. And I, I just want to tell this quick story because th this is um, really so important to me about books for living. Um, this theme about what can we do for the dead? What can we do for people we've loved and lost? Um, because also I write about a wonderful friend who died of cancer when we were in high school, a young woman, and how the little prince brings her back. Um, and I write about everybody I knew who didn't survive the AIDS era and how a book called The Gifts of the Body by Rebecca Brown brings them back. And I write about the book Rebecca, which I know is a favorite we share, and how it brings back a friend of mine named Terry, who was the unhappiest person I've ever met. Um, who, by the way, thought Mrs. Danvers was a heroine. <laughs> Um, and, and all of that came to a point when I was in a bookstore in Atlantic Beach, Florida. And I was doing my usual thing. I was saying to everybody, what are you reading? What are you reading? And she said to me, do you have time for a little story? And I said, sure. And she said, I want to tell you about my husband. She said her husband had been a huge nonfiction reader. He read history, biography, current events, and he loved reading. But she said in the last couple of years of his life, he had been so sick that he lost the ability to concentrate on books. And he kept starting books and being unable to finish them. And he would start a book, and he'd put a bookmark in it and put it aside. Start another one, put a bookmark in it, put it aside. Sometimes he'd get eight pages away from the end, put a bookmark in it, put it aside. And she said when he died, he had a stack this high of books that he'd started but been unable to finish. So she said to me, you asked me what I'm reading? And I said, yeah. And she said, I'm finishing for my husband all the books that he was unable to finish. He's not here to read, so I'm going to read for him. And to me, that's really what, what Books for Living is. Is Books for Living is reading, sharing conversations with other readers, um, about the books that are important to us, about the things that are important to us. Uh, it's, it's reading for the people who are no longer here to read, not in any morbid way, but because reading books they loved brings them back. And reading books they might have loved engages us in a conversation. And reading any kind of book that causes us to be more thoughtful about how we live every single day is really the ultimate tribute to those who aren't here anymore. Um, and I always say that if I was a mystery author, I wouldn't tell you how my book ends. Um, but it ends on a very simple line, which is I end it simply by saying, I read to live, I read for life. Thank you.